Hello everyone, welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host Kushal Mehra. All right, my guest today is Dr. John Mills. Dr. John Mills is a philosopher, a psychoanalyst, and a clinical psychologist. He's a professor of psychology and psychoanalysis at the Adler Graduate Professional School in Toronto, and is the author of many works in philosophy, psychoanalysis. and psychology including 17 books in 2006 2011 and 2013 he was recognized with a gradiva award from the national association for the advancement of psychoanalysis in the new york city for in new york city for his scholarship and he's uh, received a significant contribution to canadian psychology award in 2008 uh he also uh is part of the Canadian Psychological Association and he runs a mental health corporation in Ontario Canada but today we are going to be discussing Dr Mills book which is called Inventing God Psychology of Belief and the Rise of Secular Spirituality Dr Mills thanks for coming on the podcast well, thank you for inviting me So Dr Mills let's start with this uh obviously you uh, because it, it's a perfect segue uh why this book because uh let me put it this way there are so many books written on atheism uh obviously and you mentioned it in your book too uh all the famous ones being the four horsemen you know hitchens dawkins dennett and harris and obviously beyond that there are many other authors too who have written so so what made you think about writing this book well uh it's out of out of my own personal existential crisis that i came to write this book um because i feel that there's an innate need to seek out the spiritual in um in life and and in existence and at the same time i had a very difficult time reconciling that with the the notion of a supreme being and and so um i also started reading the literature uh and i came to uh to the conclusion that one can have a spiritual existence without the belief in uh you know an ultimate uh idealized object so um in many ways it was personal um and and also looking through you know the philosophical literature and the theological literature i realized that um there's really a, was a lack of psychological analysis about about what god represents to the psyche and to social collectives and so that's why i thought i had something unique to offer as both of a philosopher and a and a psychoanalyst and 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 hence the question for me is what does the the need to invent god uh, have to do with our you know our our lived psychological um you know lives and particularly how it resonates on on very unconscious levels of our being so so you use this specific word uh you said our need to invent god obviously now that immediately starts uh, so maybe somebody who's a believer uh will come back and immediately uh, uh say Well I did not invent God Dr Mills I I think God is real now before we start getting into the details of that now I want to read the definition of God that you have used in the text because I and you stated in the beginning of the book and I think it's very important for clarity so that people understand what specific god are you talking about so you talk about one a a supreme being conceived as the creator or originator of the universe b the principal object of faith and worship in monotheistic religion c the force effect manifestation or aspect of this being 2a a pervasive supernatural entity as divine person b possesses divine properties of perfection omnipotence omniscience omnibenevolence omnipresence sovereignty and aseity 3a the ultimate source cause and governance of the cosmos b the state or quality of being completely independent unconditioned unalterable and uncaused c self derived or self originated for a being from and of itself being in and for itself the ultimate ground of all reality and d is being itself now dr mills is very important over here is because my audience is primarily hindu and or hindu or if i was to expand my audience it would be indic 
and non-Abrahamic primarily, people who do not belong to monotheistic faiths in that sense, in the real sense of monotheism. Now for them, in a very interesting way, the, this definition of God is actually not what, how they conceive uh, what we call in Sanskrit a Brahman. So uh, uh, maybe I want to start with you on this premise itself. You, you do address this question in the book. In, 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 I forget the exact page number, but I clearly remember you also addressing the via negativa definition or the via negativa conceptualization of God. But maybe I'll start over here. Why, why would you choose this definition and maybe not the via negativa one? Was there a specific reason for that? Well, this is more or less a condensation of the traditional uh, arguments for the existence of God that we would see in, in, in Western literature. And I confess, I, I'm completely ignorant about, about your religion. And, and hence, that's why I was fascinated by your article in Quillette that um, was quite um, you know, illuminating in the sense that I had no clue that there were, um, you know, an atheistic tradition, uh, you know, in your culture. So uh, that that was primarily a Western bias. Usually, we do, we do think of monotheism uh, um, as a you know a dominant um, you know umbrella for many of the uh, the Abrahamic religions, as you well know. Um, I did not write the book as a critique of religion. It was specifically about a critique of the God posit or the God construct. And I did not have a need to, to really um, uh, criticize, um, you know, social collectives based upon the religious practices. Like I, I fully understand in many ways why people uh, have religions and they, they <laughs> serve an incredible uh, cultural, psychological significance uh, for societies. So let's get into the God, uh, the the existence of God and the concept of God itself. So what, what would you say, uh, how would you go about it? Somebody came back to you and said, but Dr. Mills, God is not just a concept. Uh, God is real. And so what would we, that would be the first response you know every time a believer would give you it, it may be a concept for you but to me this is something that i feel and something that i know so how does one if if i was a, a believer and i was coming to you how would you have a conversation with me about the what god is and why god cannot be conceptually uh, tenable uh, i think god is conceptually tenable the question becomes, how does a concept become a empirical real object in the universe? So the, I guess um, when I have discussions with, uh, uh, with theists and uh, religious uh, people, and I have many friends in, in psychology of religion in particular, um, that we, we usually have, you know, have a start, we come with the starting point of, of mutual respect and acceptance of one another and recognition for you know people's unique needs and feelings and and beliefs um because it's there's no need to be antagonistic uh, so if if one has a comes from the, the standpoint of mutual recognition that we have different beliefs um then we don't have to take the uh, discussion personal. But those who want to say, um, I know, I feel that God exists, um, then that's an appeal to uh, the phenomenology of their lived experience, which I would acknowledge. But um, just because you feel something, just because you know something in intuitively, doesn't make it an extent uh, you know, real being that exists independent of your mind and uh, is the um, creator and sustainer of the universe. So the burden really of proof is not on me. 
the burden of proof it would be on on the believer to to try to show some evidence for God's existence. And so I would ask, you know, what kind of evidence do you have that you could present that might change my mind? Because you're, in your book, you say God cannot exist as anything but an idea. The God hypothesis is merely a conjecture as supposition based on a fantasy principle conditioned by unconscious illusion sustained through social ideology. Albeit a logical concept born of social convention, God is actually a semiotic invention and a symbolization of ideal value. Now, <laughs> that might hurt a lot of people <laughs> and it might, uh, it might uh, shake them. But I would request you to maybe expand on these words. So what do you exactly mean? Maybe you can, we can spend some time and you can explain to us what exactly do you mean by this? Sure. Well, um, the question I have is really why, what is the psychological motivations that would uh, drive people to um, have belief in, in God? And so... Um, this is very complex because, you know, as adults, we've already been, uh, we've already gone through our childhood development. We've been conditioned by uh, society and customs and, 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 and rituals and, and belief systems and dogma, et cetera. Uh, so usually uh, most people um, who, who come from a religious background in particular uh, feel that it's a, unquestionable truth it's a truism it's something that one doesn't even remotely um uh you know tend to try to invalidate it's just accepted because that's the way one's culture is um of course there are certain cultures that may maybe uh, don't have the emphasis on god as a transcendental um you know subject but um Nevertheless, men, mo most people who were raised in a monotheistic um, environment or society are going to have certain uh, conditioned ways of thinking about God. Um, but uh, the premise here is that all experience is psychologically mediated. You can't, you can't, you know, encounter the world. You can't encounter others without processing what our relations to these objects and and other people mean to us so if we follow certain tenets of psychoanalysis that we have desires and we have conflicts and we have longings and and we project them onto our environment and into our culture and if you have um, a sea of people who are all substantiating the same thing and believing in the same thing, it, it then becomes very easy to have these unconscious forms of knowing or unconscious forms of communication that, that condition uh, certain ways of being in the world. So um, what that means, though, is that instead of God being... Um, given as a, a presupposition, um, meaning that um, people would say it's self-evident, uh, I would want to come back and look at the psycho psychological dynamics that are motivating that. So people desire these the very things that they believe in. They believe, let's say, in an afterlife. They believe in a an omnipotent being that's all loving, caring, good, uh, beneficent, um, and that they're going to be comforted um, yeah, when they perish, um, where all their wishes in many ways and their, will be uh, you know, granted and their suffering will be eliminated. And so these are very powerful ideas. Um, you know, God represents so many things to people, you know, like, an, an ideal father, you know, an, ex, an exalted father in the sky, uh, uh, etc. So um, there, there are there are many types of fantasy systems 
that are operative in, in the belief. And these fantasy systems then uh, interpellate the mind and we operate as if these things are real. And, and there's many other reasons for this, of course. Uh, there's group cohesion or in-group membership. There's acceptance and validation of, of, of people. There is acceptance for suffering. Um, and there are many different types of uh, psychological defenses or what we call defense mechanisms that, that help people um, survive this world. So, so um, that, that kind of in a nutshell is the notion that God is a, um, a fantasy uh, or a fiction that is based upon uh, an argument of des from desire. We, we want that. We, we, we want a supreme, all good and loving um, attachment figure, uh, a parent. Um, we want to be comforted. Uh, we want guarantees that, uh, that the things that we can't experience now will be rewarded for one day. Uh, and we also need to have um, certain types of value systems superimposed on us as a way for us to behave socially with others. Um, and we also need law and order. And hence, we have certain codes of conduct that are imposed um, as, a as a supernatural uh, principle and expectation, or there will be consequences. And hence, there's such a big emphasis on, let's say, sin or punishment uh, in you know, in the Abrahamic religions in particular. Dr. Mills, you, you, you are very precise when you say, or obviously you have already hinted at that, that, you know, in your book, you say we should not confuse the God question with religion, which is more of a critique of metaphysical postulates rather than human societal practices. But I'm more interested in number two. That's what interests me. So okay. in two, you say, what is missing from most atheistic analysis is a proper exposition of the underlying psychological dispositions and unconscious conflicts motivating this debate, which more properly accounts for why human beings have the need to invent God. Now, this is where I actually got interested, and I couldn't agree more with you as, as someone who actually did go through the entire New Atheism literature myself. I tried to read all their books. Like There were 14 or 15 books at that time that had come out, one after the other, one after the other. And when I read your book, you know, it was like that light bulb flashed to me immediately. I was like, he's so right, because not even a single book actually went down and said, why does God exist as a concept? They all said, oh, this is not real. This book says this. This is not real. You said that. This makes no sense. It was, you know, it was, uh, uh, I would say, a more... Uh, a combative approach with the new atheistic approach was very combative and they just took a hammer and they just found the nail that is religion and they would just you know go on hammering each and every nail and okay uh, leviticus chapter number this you know verse number this says that or the quran this verse says that or 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 the old testament uh, says that the new testament says that this religion says that this religion none of this makes sense i'm not going to bother about it you on the other hand ignore in this book, you actually ignore the entire subset of that. You're like, I don't know why you guys are doing that. So can you explain how did you come to think about this? I'm more interested in how did you think about this more than anything else. That's what fascinated me. Well, I guess, you know, in being in the, in the helping professions, um, I'm more interested in connecting with people than alienating myself from them. And let alone hurting them psychologically by by wanting to to you know to take away something that, that they cherish or find is sacred. So um, I don't have the same views of anti theism that the new atheists tend to have. Um, not all of them do, but um, the one the as you mentioned when you when you philosophize with a hammer, you you know you usually uh, destroy the whole object. And, um, so I'm not, um, that interested in, in creating conflict when, uh, none needs to be created. Um, 
but I, I am interested in being able to have conversations with people. And um, so, like I, like I mentioned, I have many friends who are theists. I have many agnostics and many atheistic people who are friends. They, and I, I love to hear their stories and I invite them. And even though I might not believe in them, there is something that is compelling because we, I think we're all unconsciously seeking the numinous. We're all wanting that feeling of transcendence, that feeling of the sublime, that, that feeling of, of a unity with, let's say, the self, our society, and the cosmos. And yet we all have, con you know, we've contrived different uh, philosophical systems or th theological systems cosmological systems to bring that about um, and it's and because it's so complex you know psychologically we're complex and uh, and sociologically that that um, often religion you know provides a lot of needs and and the the resistance of giving that up of having to mourn our our being in relation to our to lack um, uh, or, or the absence of, of God, because we first of all have to say, um, we have to ask the evidential argument. Where is the evidence? Given that God has never manifested, never appeared, how, how do we go about then justifying the belief in something that's invisible? And so, um, that is where um, I'm more interested in psychologically, what does God represent to us internally? And hence, um, for the believer, um, you know, there is a, a personal relationship they have with God. There is a, a loving attachment, just like, a, you know, one would want with their parents when they're, when they're small infants. There's a feeling of merger with the love and and the protection and the and the nurturance that one gets. So, why wouldn't a psychological model be a um, a natural paragon for looking at why we would construct this supreme being when there's no evidence for it? So, I, I kind of go on. I can go on and on with various types of motives. Please um, do. Please do. <laughs> well. Um, on one hand, you can you can be um, rather insulting or pejorative uh, if you want to be the the new atheist who you know bangs people over the head with with truth and reason and science and um, or you can um, uh, be a little bit more of a human being about things and and try to understand where they're coming from uh, and so. On one hand, one could take a negative argument um, and say that, um, you know, God um, is based upon a collective neurosis, that we're anxious, uh, that we have to face our being toward death, that we have to make sense out of the, the complexity of our, of our societies and, uh, and the universe. And how do we do that? Um, so in many ways, uh, we engage in various obsessional types of behaviors, uh, ruminations, um, thoughts in order to quell our anxieties. We are engaged in a multitude of displacements by focusing on other things or little details of other things to get us away from the anxiety of, of, the, of the question uh, itself. So. Um, it's also nice when one resolves conflict and one doesn't have any internal dilemmas. And, and hence, then God becomes a convenient um, a defense to help uh, alleviate anxieties as well as, as fulfill certain wishes. Um, in many ways, um, you know, we have a transference unto God, meaning that we, we're projecting uh, our internal desires 
our wishes, um, you know, our uh, complexes, and um, and you know, we also attribute many different types of uh, uh, you know human motivations and attributions to God as a anthropic uh, macro anthropos in the sky. Um, and there's convenient ways to use reason and logic and creativity to try to fill in the gaps in, in um, our arguments. But let's, let's first come back to the notion that just because you have a thought or conceive of a, of a supreme being doesn't make it so. You know, our thinking is different than, let's say, uh, the ontological independence of the cosmos. Um, so, um, you know, again, a thought and, and a real object that's empirically demonstrated and, and um, uh, you know, showing, shown to have any validity is something that we would demand uh, some, some type of, of manifestation of, the, of its existence. So this is where people, I think, um, they rely upon. This is what I've been raised to believe, um, or it's too complex for me. Um, I'm just going to take it on faith, and hence, faith is means to trust. Um, and and others um, don't spend that much time thinking about it. It's just a social fact to them. So. So in that sense, from what I have understood, God is like a scaffolding. It's a scaffolding which is uh, on which you base your life on. It gives you that sense of comfort and stability um, and uh, lets you walk on it while you deal with so many variables that are hitting you and your brain. Because uh, maybe if I'm looking at it, um as as from a believer's perspective is when when a believer tries to look around the cosmos the world there's so many things in this world so much complexity if you look at it from that sense there's so many things going on how do i make sense of all of this and and if i was just going to say yeah most probably the big bang happened and then we had the primordial soup and then one thing led to another and then we have natural selection and boom we're all here by chance. The believer's going to go, wait, what? Are you trying to tell me that I'm literally here by chance? That that could have hap it could have happened that I would not be here? And that's when, don't you think God becomes like that amazing, comforting structure? And to be very honest, which is why I get a lot of uh, pushback from new atheists, especially where I actually don't even want them to stop believing in God at times. I feel, you know, it just takes, uh, you know, like at times it takes the wind out of their sails. And in many cases, and I think you, why, why I'm doing this is because you deal with a lot of patients, right? In your practice too. Uh, so how do you, so how would you deal with a person who suddenly comes to you and says, uh, Dr. Mills, so I'm going through a huge bout of existential crisis where I've come across these arguments and you know what? They say God is not real. So I'm having this, you know, this, this, this huge hole in my heart now. That's, that's the language they would use with you, right? Now, I don't know how to make sense of it. So, so Dr. Mills, in a situation like that, a person who has written a book literally questioning the very existence of the concept of God, how would you answer to that patient or that person coming up to you? Well, like I, I do with with everybody that I saw, um, is that it's not really incumbent upon me as a psychoanalyst to tell people how to live their lives or how to feel. It, it really is about exploring their internal experience. So the person who has a hole in their heart, uh, who feels empty inside, who feels like they're struggling with their lived existence and trying to find meaning 
out of um, uh, you know their their dilemma is is something that we would want to explore, not not to shut it down, and not to try to to cover it over with some um, you know rather uh, pat um, little answers or reassurances, because this is really what the, the existential um, you know pursuit is about. It's about trying to to find you know understand your own interior what your values are what you long and crave for in life what kind of existence do you want to create for yourself when you and particularly when when you feel like the the scaffolding has been taken away when when you had uh, you know a pretty convenient uh, way of understanding things uh, and now there, it's all in you know, in uh, question. Um, so my approach is uh, really to sit with the person's experience and, and to deal with their ambivalences because um, until you really bring these contradictory elements of our interior into communication with one another, into dialogue, we, we often don't find uh, synthesis or a solution. Um, and it's a slow, um, laborious process at times. But we, but, you know, we are all in a process of becoming that uh, throughout our entire life. And so to assume that we have everything figured out and everything has a scientific explanation uh, is also to strip away the unique quality of the lived experiences that we have. So even though you might have some material uh, explanation of the way the cosmos is structured um, and physics has the answer, it doesn't mean that you still don't pine for some type of um, you know, spiritual need. And, and so that, that's a contradiction uh, that often people face. And Hence, why religion and, and belief is uh, uh, you know a good substitute for um, having to deal with that ambivalence. Yeah, but then how how do you make sense of religions which don't have a god? There are religions to, that don't actually believe in a deity. For the classic example is the one in India, Jainism. Jainism just says there is no god in that sense in a Ishwar or a creator because the universe always existed and it always will. That's just the Jain answer. Now, you might come back and say, but Jainism does have the theory of reincarnation and karma. And, you know, you're like, there is a system, what you're doing right now. There is like this ledger that is keeping account of whatever you do. And then when you die, there is this pit stop where you go and then you're in a pit stop. And then the pit stop calculates, okay, what were the good karma and bad karma? And according to that ledger, you come back into another form now so you might you, you can come back to me but then still they don't have a god so how does that come about uh, from a psychological perspective yes well um uh, in your example though um there's still the belief in an afterlife there's the belief that our behavior in our current life is going to affect our, our future life that there's this notion that our soul somehow detaches from our physical body is in a, you know, some abeyance or some state of, of uh, a pit stop, as you put it, uh, only then to um, rematerialize somewhere. And, um, and so you still have a cosmogony in, the, in that system of thinking that, that is, um, Maybe you could simply replace a godhead with the pit stop. I don't know. You'll still have to. Ex you'll still have to explain how it's possible that you could have the immateriality of the soul. You would still have to explain the mechanism of how it would be reinstantiated in a new body in the future. You would have to explain the principles of value that sustain that. Like, is there an agency involved in, in making these decisions? Um, so, so many different questions could be 
composed uh, of, of that belief system. Um, but nevertheless, the belief system seems to be very psychologically motivated. Um, be good to other people and to other things, and you'll come back better. If you aren't, you're going to come back like a cockroach or, or whatever the, the, um, the reincarnation uh, would, would entail. But nevertheless, it's a motivation for social behavior. Um, I was impressed with um, visiting Jain temples uh, when I was in India and with their, with their um, imagery and, and as, as well as um, reading some of their literature too, um, uh, particularly the notion of how violence is uh, an orienting principle around how they live their lives. But, but um, yeah, so anyway, there's still organized ritual. There's still organized belief in that religion that does transcend um, the, uh, you know, the physical death of, of one's body. And that, uh, that does have supernatural uh, principles uh, that it's based on. And hence, that would be similar to a God, a God concept. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, so I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. Uh, they, they would come back to you and they would say, but no, the whole point of the karma theory is that you have to get detached. The whole point is getting detached from this whole... Pre the ultimate aim is not getting reborn. The ultimate aim is just getting out of the cycle itself. So you need to stop all these attachments in the long run. So it's very interesting. So the ultimate attachment has to stop. The ultimate goal is getting moksha. Right? As they say, moksha is when the soul or the Atman, to use the perfect word of Sanskrit, gets out of this continuous cycle of getting reborn again and again is because we, we keep on acting and those act, certain actions that we take they lead to results and those results need to us getting reborn again and again. So ultimate goal in most Indian philosophy and Indic philosophies is that I need to realize this, this reality and I need to detach myself and get out of it. But I want to talk about something else now. Now, something very interesting, I, this is just, I wanted to add this fact in our chat is that you say you have written that out of the 300 identified professional journals in religious studies in the academic world covering multiple languages and countries there is not one that is devoted to atheistic studies talk about how the hell can something like this happen when atheism is all around us yeah good good point um <laughs> that's what i thought too when i was uh, writing a paper like, where am I going to place it? <laughs> and so, so um, I did find uh, one journal uh, on um, uh, philosophical essays in humanism, but that that's now defunct. It, it collapsed. Uh, so the rest are basically philosophy uh, and psychology of religion and, and theology journals. So that, that would not be friendly to uh, an article like mine. So um, I decided to ex expand it into this book, which um, has an audience on some level. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating that uh, in spite, uh, you know, what, what baffles me when I read this bit of information was that I thought New Atheism won. Well, it didn't win enough. It couldn't even get a journal going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's rough. Now, Dr. Mills, I want to focus on this. Now, now it's very interesting. In, in Obviously, in Western philosophy, uh, we can trace it back, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, to Dionysius, right? Uh, via negativa. He, uh, or Dionysius basically came up with the concept of via negativa as the first one in Western philosophy or Western traditions. Um, in India, something parallel to that is called neti neti. Not this, not that, or not this, not this. Uh, there are different uh, Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism. Different schools have uh, this, and they're pretty much in the familiar reign, uh, uh, in the range. I mean, Adi Shankara talks about it uh, in Gaudapada's Karika. Then you have uh, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, one of the 
more important Upanishads literatures in Hinduism that they talk about it too. Now you 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 mentioned something very interesting in your book in a passing reference. You talk about even in the apophatic tradition of negative theology via negativa, which defines God by what he is not. Now, in the case of Hinduism, the God is uh, no gender. Ju- just for clarification, in the sense that Brahman that they talk about, it has no gender. Uh, this is a uniquely Christian or a monotheistic concept. This still presumes God's existence, the very thing that one has a burden to prove. Now, uh, but don't you think uh, with the definition that we started in the beginning, which is why I read it out, which is your working definition, don't you think uh, a lot of the arguments that you give would, would would not exactly fit in in that sense with the via negativa conceptualization of uh, God, if I was to say that? Uh, yes, but the the presumption here is that that God still exists. So it's already predicated. Um, so when when people are talking about the apophantic tradition where they're defining what God is not, they're already presuming God exists. So, you know, existence is not a predicate. I mean, so you, you just can't, uh, you know, no proposition is proof of itself. You, you can't just simply think something into being, only a thought. Um, so, so it's incumbent upon <clears throat> the negative theologist to, to still be able to answer what God, that, or that God is even, let alone what God is. So, so, so would via negativa be the perfect cop out to the uh, to uh, <laughs> to get rid of the atheist question? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, no philosopher, it's not incumbent upon me to, like, have to prove the negative. I mean, the negative is that which is not, that which does not appear, that which is not present. So if anything, if we're going to use a empirical criteria, we've already proved that God doesn't exist by, by reference to the mere fact of, of its uh, absentia. So um, it's one thing to know what what's not here, and it's another thing to then predicate something that's hiding behind some anthropic curtain, or is uh, of divine hiddenness, or uh, or is invisible. So um, that that's a very difficult claim to have to pr- to prove. Hmm. Yeah, it would be something like the Russell's teapot, right? I mean, I can't prove it. Somebody else cannot disprove it kind of a situation. So the via negativa is the perfect case of, yeah, you can't disprove it. I can't prove it. But yeah, you you you, you, you make a valid point that it still stems from the belief. The uh, a priori assumption over there is that there still is a God. You, the working definition they function with is there is a God. It's just that it's beyond our comprehension and it's uh, beyond our senses. And we cannot say because it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. And when you ask, what is it? Well, we don't know because it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. So so it's a perfect answer to the person who is demanding belief in that sense to get out of uh, the conversation uh, in that point of time. But uh, uh, Dr. Mills, I, maybe now we can segue into the other aspect of the book, which was obviously about what you call the rise of secular spirituality. Now, it's, 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 it's a very unique usage of the book. So, so maybe if you could spend some time and explain now, what do you mean by secular spirituality? Well, um, you know, these are, typically self-definitions that don't necessarily apply to all people. But, um, you know, secular humanism or humanists uh, tend to be people who value and believe in in humanity and believe in um, our greater collective uh, ethos. And and so um, in many ways, spirituality for the humanist uh, doesn't uh, entail the need for supernatural explanation. It doesn't entail um, the need f- to posit a supreme being. Um, it's based upon um, natural psychology or naturalized psychology. It's based upon uh, who we are as a species. It's based upon 
the pursuit of, of truth or wisdom. It values science and logic. It is also inspired by the arts and humanities. And if anything, um, it is a commitment to um, value inquiry. And, and that ultimately is about our relation to self, others, and the world. And, and, and hence, it really is about an ethics of being. And how do, how do I want to be and how do I want to relate to my fellow human beings? And hence, this is where it, you know, it enters the realm of, of value inquiry, of culture, of justice, and, um, and the aesthetics uh, of lived experience. Um, and it's quite complex. So that's why when you ask anybody, what does spirituality mean to you? They're going to have a different reaction. Some would say their, their emphasis might be um, that they have some num numinous experience walking out in nature. Uh, others have it every day when they relate to their loved one or the friendships that they have or making love to your wife. You know, it, it, it's, it, it really is a unique, uh, the unique process of one's own individuation. And, and so hence, you know, spirituality can uh, have inner, um, you know, intersubjective and interdependent and intersectional uh, elements to it. Uh, does it come down to one thing? I, I can't really uh, define that, but um, I would I would say that if if I had to pick uh, one thing, that it would be about authenticity and about an ethical cultivation in oneself to others. Now, now he, here's a perfect time to remind everyone, and I think you make a very uh, accurate assessment in the beginning of the book, and, and I'm going to try and connect it to the latter half of the book, uh, is where you clearly mention that you know, we should not confuse God with religion, which is more uh, of a, you know, collection of human societal practices, right? That's what religion is basically. It's, it's, it's societal practices, it's ritualism and stuff like that. Now, in secular spirituality, Dr. Mills, now I'll give you my experience, literally my lived experience as a human being. Now, I, I, I call myself a Hindu. I, I've never hidden away from that tag. I own it up. I don't, I have no issues if somebody is an atheist in India, does not want to call themselves an Hindu, even though they are from a Hindu background. I don't, I don't care. And I'm sure they won't care about me calling myself. But here's the thing. Now, I enjoy participating in all the festivities. Like one of, uh, to be very honest, one of the best sites of my life, even till date, although I've post COVID, I've not gone there, which has been three years, but I used to consistently once in a while, go and attend which is called an arti it is basically a prayer it's a you know a group prayer where uh, in the iskon temple and i think that was one of the most amazing experiences i used to have in my life i used to love the song the singing the praying the dance the the puja the entire ritual the the group experience uh um in many cases, sometimes, you know, even in our house, Diwali is a very big function for Hindus in India, the festival of Diwali. We have our Diwali puja at home. I participate in it. Now, in this world of secular spirituality, Dr. Mills, how much of old religion, old practices, ancient practices that have been continuing for, poof, I don't know how many years now, how much do you think uh, they do you think they add value to the entire secular edifice itself? Um, well, it might be hard for me to know, uh, given that I'm not from your culture, but from what you described, uh, you know, from a generic point of view, I think that's exactly what people get out of uh, their beliefs. They when they when they are involved in a, in collective rituals that they enjoy, that is a, a festival and expression of their unique culture and language, then um, and music and dance and and 
and and these uh, elements, um, there is the soul is animated. There is a, a heightened sense of, a, of emotional satisfaction that one gets, particularly when you're when you're sharing it with a lived collective, and and whatever comes with that, this affective um, uh, urgency and heightened sense of, of valuation that um, is uplifting. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. And if it brings one pleasure and satisfaction and, and a sense of community and, and connection, uh, and, you know, with other people that, that strengthens bonds. This is why it's lasted and will last, I think, for centuries. How are you going to replace that? So um, those are, that's what I'm, I'm mostly interested in whether it be um, people's experiences like you um, or cultivating my own is what, you know, what breathes uh, spirit into us and what makes life worth living and seeking, uh, seeking out experiences that continue to sustain um, that kind of excitement about being. And and in fact, I would I would give another example from the West because I know a few uh, friends from the Jewish community who who are atheists and they also go to the synagogue and and I and I would all in fact I used to find a lot of commonality with the Jewish community in that sense because a lot of secular Jews would just be like yeah I don't believe in those things but. I think it's a very good system that I want to be part of. And and in that sense, you know, it's, it's a kudos to the Jewish community that has embraced uh, the disbelievers as part of their own. And they're like, no, please come. You guys can be part. And they, they celebrate the festivals. Uh, they, they take part in everything. And, and it's, it's a very interesting concept in that sense. And it all goes down back to the psychological underpinnings behind it that at the end of the day, even if we may, you know, we may not need the scaffolding of a creator. Like personally, maybe you and I don't need it. I, I'm, I'm being very open about it. But we all need the scaffolding of a community. And then these are just things that we have come up over the period of time of, you know, just making sense of so many people and so many numbers. Like, and, and, and you see this in sport too, right? Like you're going for a football match. I mean, you guys call it soccer over there. Or, uh, you are you know, you go for a baseball or uh, or a American football thingy or ice hockey, and you you have the huddle, and you know you have a collective thing that you shout in the huddle. I mean, it's a pretty religious experience, to be very honest. If you break it down to its bare bones, I mean, that's exactly what religious people are doing, and we kind of you know replace that and replicate it in a in a in a secular zone. But we do have. Uh, uh, at least in my experience in Western societies, I've lived a bit in the West. Uh, I now live in India. I have a little bit of familiarity with Western society. Uh, do you think the Western society now has a, and maybe this could be our last segment that you know we can focus on. Um, I see a God-shaped hole in the West, if I was to put it <laughs> in, 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 in a very uh, straightforward way. And in, in, a, in a weird sense, I I think new atheism won in the early to late 90s to mid 2000s. It actually won. It, it took the hammer and in a metaphorical sense, it smashed the church. It hasn't smashed the mosque, but it has smashed the church in that sense. Because religiosity levels, I, I, I read a, a detailed study from the government of Canada and I was seeing religiosity levels dropping in Canada too. Um, I think it was Stats Canada, uh, they had just released the uh, where it has now come down to 65% believers in Canada, which was very interesting. If I remember, uh, please don't quote me on that. Uh, it was a few weeks ago when, when I read the study. And something very interesting is happening. And now I want to take you to uh, another professor and a, a thinker and a writer who I admire a lot uh, in the West. It's uh, Dr. John McWhorter. And uh, Dr. McWhorter seems to 
has uh, have uh, has written this new book on what he says is that there is a new religion in town now and the old religion which was smashed basically uh, by new atheism i don't know what else was the reason and now it has come up in the form of what michael shermer likes to call it atheism plus atheism with some new new you know designs uh, and right. and so aren't we going back to the old ways dr mills in a very weird sense then well if, if we're going to define religion as that which binds people then this is a new form of binding so um but if we're talking about in the in the west here uh the social justice movement and the culture wars that you're alluding to and and particularly the the woke ideology that is circulating um that's a complex topic in itself uh yes it could be equated with with dogma that can't be questioned and hence you see all kinds of um um you know, Ill illiberal left uh, people who are more acting more like liberal uh, authoritarians who are um, who are imposing this moral absolutism on all of society where you if you have different points of views or, you know, question their values, it leads to a horrible splitting and division that we particularly see in the United States these days. Um, so uh, is it based upon um, an, an ideal or utopian vision of what society should be about? And is that what's driving this new religious movement? Um, why is it so popular among the youth, for instance? Um, I would, having not analyzed the issue uh, very with much thought, um, it's a it's a good psychological question. Why do people feel the need to um, alert themselves to the world as a more morally good person and 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 broadcast their virtue at the same time condemn other people who don't have the the same belief systems uh, that they have? let alone commitment to the types of political, um, uh, social movement and activism they would like to see bring about. Um, some of this is clearly ideology. It's completely illogical. Um, and this could get us into a whole different uh, discussion. So what, what I'm more interested in is in the psychological underpinnings, are they parallel to what an average religious person goes through? is is my, where i come from and where i'm interested in uh, uh it what the movement is the merits or the demerits of it i'm not interested in that i'm just interested in the larger you know out, outsider's view like the meta view of it uh, or a macro view of the behavioral pattern so i'll give you an example like i see so many similarities like it, it, i see original sin i see purity and pollution i see uh, blasphemy it's 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 if if i look at it as an outsider i mean i have no skin in the game in this i'm just an is a, a 41 year old disbeliever sitting in india looking at these things happening in the west and i'm just looking at it from where i stand it and this is my view and i've shared it many times i think new atheism destroyed the old gods and now i don't know they i guess they always needed one so <laughs> Here it comes back again, and and it's it's in, in a new form, and and uh, in fact, I've asked this to everybody. I was like, so will new atheism ever own up to its doing, <laughs> when it's got new religion back? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know uh, how how to go about answering that. I mean, everybody's um, view of religion is going to be different. Um, <clears throat> would uh, you know? Would the social justice warriors view it as a religion? Um, is it a way of being? Is it a projection of an idealized uh, state of futurity of a po of a possible uh, a social world that's based upon um, 
in many ways, the fantasies of equality, the fantasies that we're all the same, that everything uh, should fall into place if one believes this, uh, if one doesn't question this. And if you do, you'll, you'll suffer from cancel culture to, uh, uh, to fire and brimstone. So, I mean, it, in many ways, I think you're, you're right to highlight some of these psychological dynamics that are, that are operative, but usually as social fantasy systems that are unconscious. Um, a lot of people um, that, that espouse um, the new religion, the new woke religion, um, the quarter has, I think, not inappropriately, you know, referred to it as racism because it, it privileges um, uh, being able to talk about people's skin color uh, and, and particularly now uh, demonizing uh, anything that's uh, post-colonial, uh, particularly you know, anything white. Um, it's, it's taken on uh, certainly its own ideology uh, in the West, uh, but, but mainly in the States. Um, I don't see it so much up here in Canada, but it doesn't mean it's not, it has infiltrated about every university campus you imagine. Um, what's interesting to me about it is that people have, they're so certain about their ethics and their, and their moral absolutism that they impose it uh, on, on others in a, in a very aggressive manners when that shuts down debate and dialogue. Um, and I, I imagine we're going to see a, a turn of the tide because people are getting quite fed up with, um, you know, scapegoating people and, or, or simple binary thinking when, um, you know, identity politics exists wherever we go. It's, it's, it's not just either or, it's usually both uh, and. So, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I, ha having not much information about uh, the Border's new book, I haven't read it. Uh, I am familiar with his work, and uh, I like him very much. Yep, uh, uh, I I completely understand where you're coming from, and uh, it's just fascinating to me. I just think, um, from where I stand, I'll reiterate: I think the West is rediscovering itself. I think it lost its old culture, and it's kind of re reigniting itself and um, it's a state of turbulence as they say. we're going on a flight and sometimes you have some turbulence and uh, this is just a, a societal turbulence and then eventually the weather clears out and then we have stability and what, what eventually might come is that there might be some very good and valid points in this new social justice ideology that has come and we should learn from that and I think they do have a lot of valid points. I mean, anybody who says they don't is just, I think, wrong. They do. They they have shown the light. Uh, whether you know the social justice movement in India, uh, whether the social justice movement in the West, I think it has shown the light on many things which we should talk about. And I think it's just the human way of exploring itself. And <laughs> in a very lighthearted way, I think prosperity does this to people. People just get bored, and then they come up with things. And the, so the West is actually a victim of its own growth in that sense. Uh, the West grew so much that, you know, they were like, what do we do? Okay, let's come up with something new. But it's okay. But before we wrap things up, Dr. Mills, uh, uh, any, any last words that you want to share and any new projects that you want to talk about uh, with with the you know the listeners and the viewers well um you know i appreciate very much your invitation to have me speak i i haven't um i haven't been immersed in this topic for several years given the book came out uh 2016 i believe um so it's actually it was nice to hear from your perspective how, how you were able to um you know, link link up some of my ideas to uh, your culture as well as to the the new social justice movement. Um, I would want to uh, I'd want to say that um, you know, as a as a humanist, um, we we really are going to get nowhere by tearing other people down. And um, if there's a way of finding a common uh, connection. 
based on mutual recognition, based upon hospitality with with alterity and the other and 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 creating um you know an open inviting space uh for sharing one's lived experience then my guess is that we'll be able to find a common way of relating and connecting and i hope that's what happens in society or social collectives throughout the world um but as a in many ways a skeptic and a pessimist, um, I'm much more uh, optimistic about my personal life than I am about the, the fate of the world. So um, my actually my next book that uh, is being um, under review right now is called The uh, End of the World. And um, I'm very much interested in exploring why we are destroying ourselves and the planet and um, why we are living on the brink of extinction. So I'm not sure when that book will actually come out, but that uh, that it will come out sometime. Well, I actually look forward to that because uh, I'm I'm actually on the opposite side. While I understand what we're doing with climate and climate change is real, I'm actually an eternal optimist. I I genuinely look at things on the brighter side. I I believe humanity has it in 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 it. You know we have it in us to come up with solutions. So I'm actually really looking forward to that book. So whenever it comes back, you know, please uh, let me know. I'll read it and, you know, I'll call you again and we'll have a chat about it. But before uh, I wrap today's session up, once again, Dr. Mills, uh, thank you very much for coming and having a chat with me. I thoroughly enjoyed your book uh, and I wish you all the best. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Take care. All right, guys, I'm going to... I'm going to leave you with the last paragraphs of Dr. Mill's book. I, I love them and I had highlighted them. So he says the spiritual quest does not require a supernatural intelligence to give purpose and qualitative value to life. For this is incumbent on us. Even though we are all headed for a pine box, this does not mean that we cannot find intrinsic worth and meaning in living our lives for the present, not for a fantasized future. Despite that, the thrust of our being toward death is imposed on us with consult without consultation, we can faithfully choose to live our lives creatively and authentically as the pursuit of meaning and value, which naturally privileges our relationality to others for nothing else really matters. The call for call of finitude is a constant reminder that we are obligated to actualize our possibilities because we only have one chance at life. This makes every decision we make a priority and we have no one else to blame for our choices but ourselves. To be honest with ourselves and others, free of blind ignorance or self-deception, to open ourselves up to the effective interiority of our beings, to experience genuine emotion and spontaneity, to love, work, and play, to tolerate ambiguity through the courage to be, to have compassion and empathy for others' suffering, as well as our own, to contemplate the numinous and follow a moral path and be committed to becoming a decent human being. What else can we be, be reasonably asked for? We are the authors of our own lives to be lived and relived, Despite our passions, fallibility, and finite natures, we have no other recourse than to accept our thrownness with humility. We call this humanism that the I that is we and the we that is I. These are beautiful words, and I'll like to end today's session with these words uh, from Dr. Mill's book. Once again, when you, if you're watching this on YouTube or you're listening to this on Spotify, iTunes, when you go to the description of the podcast, you'll find a link to Dr. Mill's book. I recommend you guys go and read it. It's an interesting book. It's slightly technical at times, so you might have to go through a few pages again and again to understand what exactly he's saying. But I would recommend you guys read it. I know a lot of you disbelievers watch this podcast, so maybe you can go and check it out. As far as I'm concerned, you know the drill, guys. Please support the podcast, subscribe to the channel, like the video, and you can support it on YouTube and Patreon or buy the merch, or send me donations on UPI. I will see you guys next time. Until then, namaste, take care, bye-bye.